Hi everyone, I'm Chris. I'm an Applications Engineer with the AWR Group of National Instruments. And today I wanted to talk about load pull and specifically how swept load pull data files can be used in our software, Microwave Office. A little background, in version 12 of our software, which was released around uh, IMS 2015 last year, we introduced the capability to deal with swept load pull files, that is, load pull data files that have an independent swept parameter, typically power. We're now on version 12.03, and in those three minor releases, we've had the opportunity to go out and interact with designers that use load pull data on a daily basis and get some great feedback and incorporate even more functionality into our software. So that's what I'd like to touch on today. What is load pull? It simply means sweeping uh, the impedance you're presenting to a transistor or a device, uh, measuring its performance, and then plotting the resultant performance contours on a Smith chart. Now, recently, EDA tools like Microwave Office have been adding uh, increased capability in dealing with uh, more and more complex sets of load pull data. And uh, of course, the strategic use of these capabilities can uh, significantly streamline power amplifier design flow and get your first cut prototype done faster and more accurately. Some specifics about uh, the example I'm going to show here. <clears throat> it's based on a Corvo gallium nitride uh, device, about 10 watts of P3DB power, uh, 28 volt drain operation, and we're biasing uh, essentially class B, or very heavy class A, B. Class A, B, you can see we only have uh, 30 milliamps of quiescent current, and we can also see the class B behavior with the dynamic load line. So we're using a, a monolithics device model, and if uh, we take a look at the model, it's uh, very sophisticated. We can push down into the model, and that allows us to uh, make measurements not at just the package plane, but actually at the current generator plane of the device, right on the drain pin of the die plane. And we'll also note here that we've got uh, one of our gamma probe elements, and we can use that to actually plot the impedances uh, right at the device die plane, uh, again, with the measurements set up uh, at the package plane. Back to uh, some specifics about load pull. Um, one strategy we see people using as uh, nesting together uh, source and load pull. So typically, you're starting your device design and you need to establish a source match in order to do your first cut load pull. And that means doing source pull. But to do that, you have to assume uh, load impedance. And of course, changing load impedance will change the source match and vice versa, changing the source match will change the performance uh, on the drain side. So one way to uh, streamline that is to nest together source and load pull. So you have a load pull data set that contains both. For each source point, you've got a full set of uh, load pull data. And for each load point, you've got a full set of source pull data. So here we can select uh, an impedance on the source side, and we get a resulting set of contours. And we can change that uh, impedance just by moving markers. And we get another uh, update on our load pull contours. And conversely, on the load side, if we change its impedance, uh, we get the source contours with that load impedance. And uh, once again, just moving a marker, we can update our source pull. So that allows you to um, not have to iterate between source and load pull. It's all there in one data set. Uh, once you have your initial source match established, you can do a more sophisticated uh, load pull, uh, load only. And you can use as many frequencies uh, as you need, essentially. And we can also plot in terms of uh, other performance parameters. So uh, typically, that means plotting in terms of power, uh, specific output power, or a specific uh, gain compression point, not just relying on the uh, swept input. And we, all, we also have what we call an overlap uh, contour. It's the uh, small oval-shaped contour there in the middle of the graph, and it's where we're meeting two performance parameters at the same time. And of course, we have maximum markers to uh, easily point out the, the maximum points for any measurement uh, across frequency. A little bit about uh, Class J, uh, some uh, quick background. Uh, Class A theoretical efficiency, that of course is a 360 degree conduction cycle, 50% theoretical maximum. Class B means uh, uh, 
180 degree conduction cycle, so you're only conducting a half of a cycle. Uh, theoretical efficiency, 78.5%, and of course class AB is between uh, those two. Uh, but approaching these maximum efficiencies uh, is dependent upon uh, achieving a perfect short condition at the device's dive plane uh, for harmonic frequencies, which is very difficult to do with a practical uh, matching network. So if you go on to more uh, sophisticated uh, modes of operation like class F, uh, the theoretical efficiency is actually 100% uh, for class F where you're squaring off both the voltage and current uh, waveforms. Uh, but that means infinite uh, harmonics are shorted, which isn't uh, at all practical. Uh, what we see in the literature is typically 88.4% uh, maximum when you have uh, the second and third harmonic. Uh, class J then uh, was introduced by uh, Dr. Steve Cripps in 2006. And it starts with the class B bias condition and essentially adds a reactive termination at both the fundamental and the second harmonic frequency. And uh, it therefore has less linearity impairment than something like class E, which is essentially a switch mode operation. Uh, so what does that mean uh, in terms of uh, what your waveforms look like? This is class B, as we noted before, that's 180 degree conduction cycle. And if we get uh, class J waveforms, we add in uh, some harmonic content. Uh, we squ square off the uh, current waveform essentially and we're minimizing the uh, time when the uh, device has a positive voltage and is also conducting. That drives up the efficiency. And we can reach that uh, class B theoretical efficiency um, without having to have short circuit conditions. It makes for a much more practical approach. And uh, again, this was introduced by Steve Cripps in his book in 2006. Uh, but designers were doing this in, on an empirical basis even before that. Uh, Dr. Cripps really just uh, formalized the theory. So how does that fit in with load pole? Um, apart from doing just fundamental load pole, we can also load pole at the harmonics and quickly assess the impact of controlling uh, harmonic terminations. Uh, so here, uh, in this case, I've just got a fixed uh, fundamental termination on the load side and we're pulling the harmonic uh, essentially around the entire Smith chart and we can plot uh, PAE contours uh, which show us the efficiency of the device based on its uh, harmonic termination and that lets you uh, quickly identify an area of the Smith chart uh, where you're maximizing your efficiency. Now the embedding uh, as we noted before it's important if possible to look at the current and voltage waveforms at the die plane of the device at the current generator plane instead of uh, just the package plane. And <clears throat> the monolithics model uh, is very nice. As I noted uh, earlier, you can push into it and make your measurements at the, uh, at the drain pin of that actual current generator, cur excuse me, current generator of the part. Uh, but if you don't have that uh, and you do know uh, the internal matching elements and any parasitics and have a de-embedding uh, network, uh, you can also apply that in our software and uh, plot uh, waveforms uh, based on the de-embedding network that you apply. In the absence of either of those things, a model or a known uh, de-embedding network, uh, of course this is where nesting uh, can come in handy. Again, you can nest uh, fundamental and second harmonic and essentially get uh, the same information uh, just by able to being able to manipulate both the fundamental and the second harmonic termination in the same data set. Uh, go on to system load pole. This is something that's in beta right now. We'll be introducing uh, in version 13 of our software, uh, fully released later this year. Um, it uses VSS, that's our system tool, and it's fully integrated in microwave office. And what we can do is uh, apply uh, modulated signal. Um, here we're just showing a QPSK signal, but it could be a uh, very sophisticated signal, LTE test model or 5G signal, what, you have, uh, what have you. And then we can plot uh, system level contours instead of just uh, circuit level. Uh, here we're plotting ACPR contours uh, for this device. And it's just the same as uh, essentially using circuit level load pole. System measurements can be contoured and of course that gives you uh, 
information on how the device operates under a real world signal. Uh, and as with circuit measurements, uh, system level measurements can be referenced to a specific output power level or any other measurement you have. It doesn't have to be just a function of uh, the input power. So to sum up, uh, load pole is and will continue to be a very integral part of most design flows for high power amplifiers, uh, whether it be load polling device models or using measured load pole data from uh, the lab. And strategies such as nesting together, source and load, or uh, uh, fundamental and harmonic uh, can streamline design flows and get your first, type, first cut prototypes uh, done more accurately and faster. And system level load pull, uh, as we just showed, adds another level, level of uh, sophistication for designers who need to assess uh, trade-offs under real world uh, signal conditions. That's all I have about load pull. Uh, thank you very much.